Drunk and unsteady, 125-pound Scott Hudgens held up the sock a Hamilton County corrections officer had ordered him to remove. Oh, you mother... Oh, you did it. Oh, man. Hudgens says he had never seen the recorded beating he received at the Justice Center two years ago until we showed it to him. They did that to me? They did that to you. I mean, a 100-pound guy, drunk? Them dudes need to be... I want to, them people need to be fired. No one was fired. The Nine on Your Side I team discovered the Hudgens incident as part of a five month long I team investigation of discipline in the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office. Our investigation reviewed video recordings of use of force incidents, somebody. audio recordings of interviews with witnesses, and an examination of roughly 2,000 documents, including personnel files, internal affairs investigations, and disciplinary actions in the Sheriff's Office. Record Records obtained by the I-Team show the Sheriff's Office had disciplined 14 current officers for violating the use of force policy since Sheriff Neal took office in 2013. Four of them were suspended. Three officers received written reprimands. Seven officers got counseling letters, the lowest level of discipline. Last year, an internal investigation determined corrections officer Randall Spence used excessive force when he punched an inmate in the face after the inmate was already under control. The bloodied inmate later told the I-team that he received a broken nose and busted tooth. Spence received a counseling letter. No one would tell me what happened. In the case of Scott Hudgens, officers reported that he was verbally abusive, threatened them, and threw his sock at an officer. An internal investigation concluded the officer who smacked him across the face did not violate the use of force policy, but the punch thrown by corrections officer Sanford Spate was excessive force because Hudgens was already under control when Spate hit him. Spate was suspended for 15 days. The disciplinary action filed in Spate's personnel file five months later reported that Hudgens was not injured. I was not injured. I was not plumb out. The internal affairs investigation report also noted that Hudgens wasn't hurt, even though a medical report included in the internal investigation revealed Hudgens was cut and bruised. I think I got hurt pretty good. When excessive force is used, it's it's critically important to hold the officers accountable. The I-Team shared our findings with civil rights attorney Al Gerhardstein. He did not represent anyone identified in the incidents mentioned in this story. But Gerhardstein has represented clients in three federal lawsuits filed against Sheriff Neal and the officers in those unrelated incidents involving use of force. There's a very, very uh, low-level discipline for what appears to be some very, very serious matters. The I-Team also provided the records we obtained from the Sheriff's Office to Christine Cole, the Vice President and Executive Director of the Crime and Justice Institute in Boston. She is a nationally recognized expert on law enforcement best practices. I was able to look at a videotape. That video, recorded at the Justice Center nine months ago, shows corrections officer Jason Mize pushing a 61-year-old inmate headfirst into a concrete half wall. An internal affairs investigator described the victim as frail. Mize, on the other hand, was praised by supervisors for, quote, looking good in his uniform and for being extremely fit. After the inmate fell, Mai slammed the cell door so hard it didn't close. Then he left the inmate moaning on the floor of the cell. Records show the inmate was bleeding profusely from his head and had a broken hip. He was treated by a nurse and taken to the hospital. It looks as if it's a pretty egregious um, use of force case. The internal investigation determined Mize lied about the incident and used excessive force. Internal records show Major Charmaine McGuffey, the commander of the Court and Jail Services Division, wanted Mize arrested and fired. It was the fourth time the sheriff's office determined Mize had violated the policy involving force. In 2008, the sheriff's office determined Mize was too aggressive when he punched an inmate in the face. Mize received a counseling letter. Two months later, he was laid off. 
Former Sheriff Simon Lease recalled Mize in March 2011. In 2012, records show Mize violated use of force policy again. A lieutenant mentioned Mize's patterns that were cause for concern, but Mize still received another counseling letter. In 2013, after Neal became sheriff, records show Mize hit an inmate with six to seven knee strikes, including several to his head, injuring the inmate. Mize was suspended for three days. The agency has a responsibility to deal with these things in a consistent, um, predictable, uh, timely uh, fashion. Um, and, and I don't think they've lived up to their responsibility. The sheriff's office referred the 2016 pushing incident to the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office. But prosecutors declined to present the case to a grand jury. Mize resigned on February 25th. I wonder why my face hurt. I wonder why my ribs hurt. You know, no one would tell me. For victims of excessive force, the most basic question is why. I did not do nothing to deserve that. I handed the dog to the man. Sheriff Neal declined to be interviewed for our report. In a statement, he said, we take all disciplinary matters very seriously, and we feel we reach the appropriate level of discipline. The sheriff's office says former corrections officer Jason Mize was in the discipline process when he resigned. Mize did not respond to requests for a comment. The prosecutor's office also declined to comment on why it didn't present evidence to a grand jury on the most recent incident involving Mize. The officers found to be in violation of Sheriff Neal's use of force policy referred us to an attorney who also declined to comment on their cases. Getting thrown in jail, even being convicted of misdemeanors. Hamilton County deputies have done all of that and not been suspended. And nine on your side, I team chief investigative reporter Craig Cheatham in, uncovers how deputies are disciplined when they break the law. Whenever you're ready, you may begin. Count your first step as one. It was one of Samuel Hickey's biggest tests. Police reports show Hickey, a Hamilton County Sheriff's Office enforcement officer, ran a red light, hit a car in an intersection, and kept driving. He was arrested for OVI. Sorry. Hey, partner. But the first person who uh, doesn't send through a stop, you know, I'll get you out of here as quick as I can. This was 2015. Hickey pleaded no contest to OVI. Sheriff Jim Neal did not suspend him. Nobody's hurt. Hickey is one of five Hamilton County Sheriff's deputies who have been charged with OVI since Sheriff Neal took office in 2013. One of them was suspended. Four received written reprimands, a low-level disciplinary action that doesn't require unpaid time off. Three deputies have been charged with OVI twice. Let me do your hand. Correction Sergeant Justin Hunt was arrested just a few weeks ago on his second OVI charge within the last three years. His citation shows he was going 78 miles an hour, 23 over the speed limit. Hunt has pleaded not guilty. The sheriff's office has not disciplined him yet. Corrections officer Walter Brown and enforcement officer Donald Four have also been charged twice with OVI. Both were convicted of OVI for their second arrest. Sheriff Neal did not suspend them. In 2015, following Four's OVI conviction, parking lot surveillance cameras videotaped him at the sheriff's office in Anderson Township. Records show he was intoxicated, pulled up a parking space bumper, cursed and chest bumped a higher ranking officer. After being ordered to leave, he returned and punched two walls inside the building. An internal affairs investigation found Four's actions could have supported a criminal charge. Four wasn't charged. The sheriff suspended him and Four received treatment for alcohol addiction. Last fall, Four's supervisor said his improvement has been remarkable. It's surprising that you found so many cases of employees that have violated the law, especially involving alcohol. Jeff Whitty is a 35-year law enforcement veteran, a retired Woodlawn police chief, and a volunteer for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Whitty says when police are arrested for OVI, they should be suspended. This is very concerning to me.
The I-Team also showed Witte sheriff's records that reveal corrections officer Kenneth Payne drove to work intoxicated twice in 2015. Payne was not charged in those incidents. Payne was suspended for three days for the second incident, placed on administrative leave, and received treatment for alcoholism. After that, records show Payne failed to report for work and blamed a relapse for it. A supervisor called Payne a huge liability, adding that it may be in the best interest of the department to terminate his employment. Instead, the sheriff gave Payne a three-day paper suspension. Seven months after that, records show Payne was intoxicated at work for a third time and was suspended for 10 days. It was difficult to go through and, and look at this. A year ago at Froggy's in Monroe, Deputy Bobby Caldwell told police he was intoxicated, disorderly, and had two knives and that they should arrest him. One officer told Caldwell an arrest would hurt Caldwell's law enforcement career as a Hamilton County deputy. But according to the police report, Caldwell said, it's Hamilton County. I won't get fired. <laughs> Caldwell was arrested, booked into the Butler County Jail, and pleaded guilty to disorderly conduct. The sheriff did not suspend him. So that about sums it all up, I think. Christine Cole, a nationally recognized criminal justice researcher and consultant, reviewed sheriff's office disciplinary records provided by the I-Team. It sends a message that you can do anything you want and nothing bad will happen. During the last two months, the I-Team made six attempts to get an interview with Sheriff Neal, providing specific cases and even questions. He declined and issued a brief statement, saying, that he takes discipline seriously and believes the sheriff's office reaches the appropriate level of discipline. Why don't you sit down and talk to us about the way you discipline officers? You've been provided with the comment. On Monday, we made one more attempt to interview the sheriff after he met with the Hamilton County Commission. Sheriff, you have two officers who have been charged with OVI twice. You refuse to suspend them. Why? You've been provided with the comment. We followed Sheriff Neal down five flights of stairs. You've been provided with the comment. And out the door. Sheriff, why don't you sit down and talk to us about these decisions that you've made, why you made them, and why you think this was in the best interest of uh, not only the Sheriff's office, but people in Hamilton County. Why won't you do that? I provided you with a comment on the matter? It's really hard for the community to trust the police if the police can't even trust the system in which they work to be, to be consistent and just and have integrity. And it, it seems to me that there's a lack of that in this agency. I provided you with a comment. But Sheriff Neal was consistent with his response to our questions. I provided you with a comment. He gave the same answer. 16 times in a row. Sheriff, are you going to say anything today other than you provided me with a comment? I did. I provided you with the comment. The I-Team has investigated more than 2,000 incidents involving hundreds of police and corrections officers from 40 local police departments. One of our goals is to examine how local police departments police their own and what happens to officers who violate policy, and in some cases, the law. Michael Holloway has worked hard to hide his pain. I took three or four days off work after it happened. Holloway says the chronic pain in his injured arm and spine got worse soon after he arrived at the Middletown Jail in February of last year. He was greeted by corrections officer Calvin McIntosh who had 28 use of force incidents in the last four years, more than double the total of the other nine corrections officers combined. He said, I hear I am the effing law. Holloway would become number 29. Holloway arrived at the jail after being arrested on a warrant for a petty theft charge. On the video, you can see McIntosh's hand near Holloway's injured neck, his other hand pulling back on Holloway's shirt. Holloway says it was extremely painful. It's not right. That was BS that I went through. Then according to an internal police investigation, McIntosh pushed Holloway into the cell door and into the cell.
In the cell off camera, Holloway says McIntosh punched him several times in his neck and injured spine. It hurt bad enough I was crying. You know, I mean, it, it literally put me in tears, put me to my knee. According to the jail video, McIntosh was in the cell alone with Holloway for 25 seconds. When he left, McIntosh slammed the door so hard it bounced back. I'm thinking if, if I do anything at that time, my life's in danger. A Middletown police internal investigation concluded Holloway never resisted McIntosh, was no threat to the officer, and that McIntosh used unreasonable force. The police department determined McIntosh was guilty of administrative charges of conduct unbecoming and courtesy. The police department suspended him for a day and allowed McIntosh to use holiday pay so he wouldn't lose any money. The year before, he was also reprimanded for his use of force. It's an outrage. What he did, he, he should have been charged with, with an assault with intent because he did everything he could to make sure that I was in pain and make sure that I was hurting. How do local police departments respond when their own officers are found to have violated department policy or in some cases, the law? To answer that question, the Nine on Your Side I-Team has spent months examining internal police records we requested and obtained from 40 police departments serving the tri-state, focusing on law enforcement incidents in seven Ohio and Kentucky counties. The I-Team discovered that not a single officer found to have used excessive force was charged or fired. In this incident at the Hamilton County Justice Center, the only use of force considered excessive was this roundhouse punch. The I-Team's investigation also found that theft, domestic violence, and assault allegations made against local police officers by their own departments were forwarded to the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office, but no charges were filed. In one case, an officer was allowed to retire instead of facing criminal charges. As the I-Team first reported in May, Hamilton County Corrections Officer Jason Mize pushed a 61-year-old inmate headfirst into a concrete block wall a year ago, left him moaning in pain, then flung the cell door so hard it didn't close. An internal investigation found the inmate was bleeding profusely and had a broken hip. He was facing termination. Um, it never happened uh, because he resigned. The sheriff's office referred that case to the office of Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters, which declined to present it to a grand jury. The sheriff's office did everything they could possibly do and went through every phase of the process, and it was turned down by the prosecutor's office. I can't change that. The Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office also declined to file charges against former Blue Ash Officer Chris Zelensky and ex-Colrain Township Sergeant Joseph Redmond, who repeatedly used a confidential police database to get personal information about people who were not under investigation. Prosecutors in Ohio and other states have filed felony charges against officers who violate that trust. But the Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office declined to file charges against both officers who were forced to resign. Redmond was an adjunct instructor at the Butler Tech Police Academy, but he resigned last week after the I-Team contacted him about this story. Back in Middletown, the I-Team showed up at a recent city council meeting after Police Chief Rodney Muterspall and City Manager Doug Adkins canceled an on-camera interview with us. The chief wasn't there, so we approached Adkins during a break. Why did you back out of the interview? Michael Holloway says the city of Middletown and its police department have not been held accountable for the way he was treated in jail, even denying him a copy of the investigation and how they responded to it. There is supposed to be a, a something in line that police is the police, but it's not working. One month after the incident with Michael Holloway, former Middletown Corrections Officer Calvin McIntosh got a pay raise for his continuing good performance. Five weeks later, in April of last year, McIntosh resigned. McIntosh, former Blue Ash Officer Chris Zelensky, and ex-Hamilton County Corrections Officer Jason Mize did not respond to requests for comment. Former Colerain Township Sergeant Joe Redmond told me he's made mistakes and does not plan to be a police officer again. And the Hamilton County Prosecuting Attorney's Office declined to comment on the specific cases that we mentioned in this report.
This is a high-speed police pursuit through the streets of Hamilton. But the officer driving the car claimed it didn't happen. What happened to this officer and other local police who are found to be untruthful? For months, the Nine on Your Side I team investigated how local police departments police their own officers. Last night, we revealed dozens of local officers used excessive force, but none of them were fired. Chief investigative reporter Craig Cheatham joins us in studio right now to reveal what happens to police officers found to be dishonest. Craig and Tanya, some police departments terminate employees who are caught lying. But in nearly 9 out of 10 cases of police officer dishonesty reviewed by the I-Team, the officers kept their jobs. We're going southbound on Harmony's not stopping. Either this is the pursuit Hamilton police officer Ray Nickting claimed never happened. Turning right on the grand, I'm not pursuing him. But after Nickting denied on the radio that he was pursuing the suspect, he drove even faster. Oh, never mind. Driving up to 82 miles an hour on city streets, Nickting passed a car after crossing yellow lines without using his lights or sirens as an oncoming vehicle approached. His actions last January, identified in a Hamilton Police Department disciplinary report, show Nickting violated four different general orders of the department's policy, including his actions during a pursuit. The officer caught on his own dash camera, a pursuit he insisted didn't happen. Quite frankly, I don't think the public has a lot of interest in this. Hamilton Police Chief Craig Bukite provided dash camera video of the incident recorded from four Hamilton police cars as part of the city's response okay. to the I-Team's request for police records. We also received a disciplinary report written by Hamilton Police Lieutenant Michael Waldeck. Waldeck determined Nickting provided false information several times and didn't tell the truth until two weeks after the pursuit. After Nickting knew the incident was under investigation. He was wrong. He admits that he was wrong, and he was disciplined for it. Nickting received a written reprimand, but no suspension. Chief Bukite blasted the I team for focusing on mistakes of officers instead of the good they do in the community. When you want to drag them through the mud and rake them over the coals, I think it's shameful. In June of last year, Middletown police officer Andrew Minnick denied using force against this man then admitted he intentionally kicked him in the head and lied because he was afraid of losing his job. The Middletown Police Department's investigation determined Minnick violated policies for use of force and departmental reports, but not truthfulness, even though Minnick admitted lying. Minnick was suspended for one day. A week after the acting city manager approved the suspension for Minnick, the Middletown Police Department's Facebook page featured Minnick, saying, quote, we are excited about the excellent job he does for MPD and our community. Middletown and Hamilton are in Butler County. Our investigation also found cases of police dishonesty in Warren and Hamilton counties. In this letter written years ago to local police departments in Hamilton County, Prosecutor Joe Dieters recommended a strict termination policy for any officer who was found to have been untruthful in reports testimony or interviews. But an I-Team investigation found that local police departments rarely fire cops who are caught lying. The I-Team's investigation of 40 local police departments identified 37 employees found to be dishonest by their own department. Four of the 37 were fired. Most were suspended. Some only received counseling. Is honesty important? Hell yeah, it is. Absolutely it is. Cincinnati attorney Mike Allen is a former police officer, judge, and elected county prosecutor of Hamilton County. Falsification of a police report, um, not being truthful to other officers who are investigating an incident that you're involved in as a police officer, mm -hmm. how big of a deal is that? Well, I mean, falsification of a report can be a criminal offense. Uh, it's falsification, which is a misdemeanor. But the I-Team's investigation found no police officer from the 40 departments we examined had been charged with a crime for falsifying a report. Prosecutor Dieters also provided the I-Team with a copy of this list. It contains the names of 36 current and former police officers who the prosecutor's office determined have credibility issues that need to be disclosed to defendants as required by the courts and federal law. 
Most of the officers on this list are here because they lied. And most of these officers are still working for the same police departments. By examining thousands of internal police records, the I team uncovered more documented cases of officers who lied, but their names were not on Dieter's list. It's unclear if the police departments provided the unlisted officers' names to the prosecutor's office. You want to focus in on what any officer has done wrong at any point in their career. In Hamilton, Police Chief Craig Buchheit admits he did not disclose to the Butler County Prosecutor's Office that Nickting provided several false statements related to that pursuit. But the chief believes the decision to not tell the prosecutor and the discipline for Nickting were handled properly. He was disciplined appropriately and accordingly, and we moved on. The I-Team attempted to contact police officers Ray Nickting and Andrew Minnick, but we were not successful. Today, the city of Middletown announced Lieutenant Jim Cunningham, a 28-year veteran of the department, would retire next week. The I-Team has been investigating allegations of misconduct by Cunningham and the city's response to it. And Craig and Tanya will air that story tomorrow at 6. Joining us at 6 o'clock, a Middletown police lieutenant suddenly retired today after he was confronted about his misconduct by the 9 on your side I-team. Jim Cunningham was a 28-year veteran of the Middletown PD. Chief investigator reporter Craig Cheatham is here with a look at why the city refuses to release details of its investigation of Cunningham. Craig. Tanya and Craig, city officials claim the public is not entitled to know what it learned about Jim Cunningham during the city's investigation because that information, it says, is protected by attorney-client privilege. Lieutenant Craig Cheatham, Channel 9, I'd like to ask you a few quick questions. You got a minute? For several years, the city of Middletown has been hiding what it knows about allegations of Lieutenant Jim Cunningham's chronic misconduct. The comments that you made to seven co-workers, can you talk about that? The I-Team started unraveling the story two months ago when we obtained records from the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. The records included complaints filed three years ago by seven Middletown police officers who said Lieutenant Cunningham had sexually harassed them. A female officer reported that Lieutenant Cunningham asked me to send him pictures of my breasts. Male officers said Cunningham touched them inappropriately and talked repeatedly about the size of their penises in front of other employees. Sergeant Brad Carroza described the harassment when he was questioned during the commission's investigation. They'd come in and stand at the doorway and stare down at my crotch. It happened again and again. He's made sexual comments, remarks. Well, the behavior that I've, that I've seen personally in, with him since I've been here would make, I guess, anybody wonder how you get by with all that. He had a long track record of uh, misconduct. Attorney Adam Gerhardstein, who represented the seven officers, said they took their cases to the Civil Rights Commission because they believed the city of Middletown's investigation hadn't done enough to address their concerns. I think the investigation was deliberately designed to not be uh, transparent. The city had hired outside lawyers to take notes during private interviews with more than 60 city employees. There was no written record of a report, findings, or recommendations. The city has refused to release the notes to the public, claiming they are protected by attorney-client privilege. They conducted this investigation, I think, in a way to um, shield um, the truth uh, from the public and to protect uh, James Cunningham. Have you heard of anything like that before? Where a law firm was hired and no reports were ever generated? No, I haven't. Cincinnati attorney Mike Allen is a former Hamilton County prosecuting attorney. If we're spending taxpayer dollars on a law firm, which I'm sure isn't cheap, to investigate something, you would you would think that there should be a record of that. During the city's investigation, the police department learned Cunningham had also slapped a homeless woman but failed to report it. The city concluded Cunningham violated the use of force policy and that he harassed officers, then combined all of it together, calling it conduct unbecoming, and suspended Cunningham for 30 days. Only five of those days were without pay. Under that agreement, the former police chief would determine if Cunningham needed counseling 
which is why the seven officers filed their complaints with the Civil Rights Commission. There's a lot of great officers at the city of Middletown, and, the, and my clients were among them. All they wanted was to create a more healthy, uh, supportive working environment. In 2015, the commission negotiated seven settlements with the city that paid the employees a combined $15,000, required Cunningham to get counseling, and did not allow him to directly supervise the seven officers for two years, unless they agreed to it. Former prosecutor Mike Allen says the city of Middletown has the right to share the notes from its investigation of Cunningham with the city taxpayers who paid for it. You can't or you won't? Which one? But three years later, the silence continues, and the details of the unprecedented number of complaints remain a secret. Police Chief Rodney Muterspaugh and City Manager Doug Adkins declined to discuss the case. Adkins told the Civil Rights Commission that Cunningham wasn't fired because he had a long, effective career, there were no previous harassment complaints against him, and Adkins believed the termination would be rejected by an arbitrator. The I-Team found that police pursuit policies vary widely from department to department. And so does the accountability for officers who sometimes take enormous risks during those pursuits. At speeds up to 120 miles an hour, Sharonville police race after a driver who had been clocked at nearly 100. Sharonville police review of the chase noted this officer going southbound on I-75 was weaving at 115 miles an hour. A second Sharonville officer passed vehicles twice in a no-passing zone as oncoming traffic approached. And according to police notes, a third Sharonville officer went through a red light at 56 miles an hour. The pursuit in July 2015 ended when the speeding suspect took the Sharon Road exit and crashed into a car at the intersection. Get out of the car! Get out of the car! It was very traumatic. Cynthia Kennedy Edwards was driving the car hit by the suspect. She and her passenger were injured. Her car was totaled. I saw police. As Cynthia's husband drives us to the same intersection, she says memories of the crash haunt her. Just being in the car, even with him driving, it causes anxiety and I get chest pain sometimes from that. Um, so it's caused a lot of emotional stress for me. Sharonville police records show it was one of eight pursuits that year. During half of them, Sharonville officers hit speeds of at least 110 miles an hour, and five of the eight pursuits ended in crashes. Lieutenant Jim Nesbitt is the acting police chief. In the review of the pursuits, as I understand it, they were found consistent with policy that was in place at that time. Does that surprise you? That does surprise me. Sharonville changed its pursuit policy last year and increased training. This year, Sharonville officers have been involved in only one pursuit. Nearly half of the 40 police departments the I-Team examined said they had disciplined police officers for their actions during vehicle pursuits. Most of those officers received verbal reprimands or counseling. Officers from Taylor Mill and Blue Ash ignored orders to terminate pursuits. They were given verbal reprimands. That's the type of thing you would expect to see in an agency that had a progressive discipline policy. Phil Stinson, an associate professor of criminal justice at Bowling Green State University, has researched police practices for decades. If there's no written policy or if the policy is very vague, you're not going to have much in the way of discipline. The I-Team reviewed 26 local police pursuit policies. Some, including Sharonville's, were vague. Their good judgment and reasoning has to come into play when they're making that decision in the field. Our officers have exhibited good judgment. Most police departments, particularly Cincinnati, Taylor Mill, and Fort Wright, provide stricter guidelines that suggest more accountability. The only pursuit that prompted an officer's suspension during the last four years was this one in 2015. 
Cincinnati officers collided with each other and the suspect got away. We should all be on the same page, not only in pursuits, but in most of the things that we do. Cincinnati Police Chief Elliot Isaac believes law enforcement agencies should get together and create a more common approach to pursuits. So it's something that I'm, I'm certainly willing to be a part of and, and even take the leadership role on to, to really try to, to see if we can have a more uniform policy in the region. But even in that one Sharonville pursuit this year, an internal police review found two officers reached speeds of more than 99 miles an hour on wet pavement, even though they lost sight of the vehicle they believed was stolen. The officers ran red lights going 30 miles an hour, then drove the wrong way on I-75 to reach police cars blocking the interstate, which the Sharonville police reviewer called a highly dangerous decision. The reviewing officer recommended extreme caution should be expressed to the officers. And those recommendations of the reviewing officer were, in fact, followed up on. But neither officer was disciplined. Can you think of a case where a Sharonville officer involved in a high-speed pursuit um, has been disciplined? I am not aware of any. They're saying that it's okay to chase people and nothing will happen to them. Cynthia Kennedy Edwards returned to the intersection where the suspect crashed into her car, hoping her story will convince police to slow down and reconsider the urge to race to justice. There's other means of pursuing an individual rather than a high-speed high pursuit and endangering others. Some police departments reference discipline in their pursuit policies. Fort Wright says an officer who ignores an order to terminate a pursuit will face a minimum 15-day suspension. And Taylor Mills says an officer who ends a pursuit for any reason, even if it's justified, will never be disciplined. Craig Cheatham, not on your side. It's called the police officer shuffle. That's when officers accused of wrongdoing keep moving from one department to another. Tonight, the Nine on Your Side I team reveals why that happens and what the Ohio Attorney General believes can help address it. Chief investigative reporter Craig Cheatham continues his investigation of how local police departments police their own. The I team requested and received records from 40 local police departments. And based on those documents, we found that a dozen local police officers have found new jobs in law enforcement after being fired or resigning following allegations of misconduct. The soundtrack of Elmwood Place is harsh and unrelenting. He grabbed me and he slammed me into the uh, police cruiser. Rough me up, slam me on the ground. Residents say complaints about village police officers and how Elmwood Place responded to them are also part of the village's identity. Where can I file a complaint against the police department? Elmwood Place hired Jacob Goodwin on January 2014. It was his fourth law enforcement job in three years. As a new town cop, Goodwin repeatedly violated department policy and was disciplined for it. He was employed with us for a year. We were going to terminate him. He resigned. Goodwin moved on, getting hired by the Aberdeen PD and the UC Health Department of Public Safety. In May 2016, just two years after Elmwood Place hired Goodwin, the village fired him after finding he couldn't account for drugs he handled. He had also failed to show up for work on three days, was groggy at work, and failed a drug test. Police Chief Eric Bartlett told the I-Team there wasn't enough evidence to refer the case to a prosecutor. If things went bad, he had a ballistic vest on. In April, Goodwin was charged with robbing five businesses at gunpoint. When I got about up here, when I'm ready to turn in here, that's when I noticed the lights. James Williams was pulled over two years ago by Elmwood Place police officer Justin Habig. I stopped right here, then the officer, he gets out his car and he had his weapon already pointed. He said, I want to see your hands, blah, 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 your hands, I'll shoot. In a police report, Habig claimed Williams was speeding and ran a red light before finally stopping. Williams denies that. He snatched me out the vehicle. He roughed me up, slammed me on the ground, talking about I'm fighting you. I'm not fighting you, bro. I don't even know what's going on. Williams was convicted of resisting arrest, reckless driving, and possession of marijuana. Had anything like that happened to you before? Never. 
Never. Candace Roper was six and a half months pregnant when she struggled to get in a police car after getting arrested for domestic violence. She said Habig, wearing a Bengal sweatshirt and shorts, rushed to the vehicle. He said, I got this. Kicked me several times in my leg. Then he grabbed me and he slammed me into the uh, police cruiser right on my uh, left side of my stomach. The criminal charge against Roper was dismissed. She and Williams filed complaints against Habig, but there's no evidence the village investigated the complaints. My baby's in my stomach. Like, how could they not even be born yet and be victims of police brutality? I, I, I couldn't get that. I still don't. Like, even still to this day, I'm like... Wow. In letters to Habig in 2015, Mayor Gerald Robertson wrote, quote, You have had more complaints filed against you than the rest of the department put together. The mayor also said that included four citizen complaints about Habig in just one week. Still, Habig wasn't disciplined. What do you think of that? I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted. Elmwood Place is not alone. In 2014 and 2015, Colerain Township determined one of their sergeants, Joe Redmond, illegally accessed a confidential police database. He avoided criminal charges by agreeing to resign. New Miami hired Redmond without requesting his disciplinary history from Colerain Township, even though that history is a public record. New Miami fired Redmond eight months later. It's a problem. Uh, some researchers refer to this as the officer shuffle, where they move from one agency to another uh, after having gotten in trouble. Bowling Green State Professor Phil Stinson says many smaller police departments can't afford to pay for a recruit to attend a police academy. So they hire people who already have their peace officer certification. As a result, you do provide opportunities for people who've washed out from one agency to be hired in other places. In January of last year, Elmwood Place's new mayor, William Wilson, fired Habig after another village officer, Todd Armstrong, complained that Habig held his gun two inches from a suspect's head and threatened to shoot him. Habig is now a full-time officer in Cleves. The Cleves police chief described Habig as an exemplary employee. He leaves this department and he goes to a different department. They don't care about that, bruh. They're going to hire him anyway. We showed James Williams a picture of Justin Habig in his new Cleves police department uniform. Another picture. That's bull****, man. I couldn't even stay here. I had to move. Candace Roper had accepted the noise in Elmwood Place. She says it was the silence and tolerance surrounding allegations of police misconduct that convinced her to leave. Justin Habig and former Elmwood Chief William Peskin did not respond to requests for comment. Former Colerain Sergeant Joe Redmond says his law enforcement career is over and the new Miami chief who hired Redmond is deceased. Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine tells the I-Team that the state should have a database that tracks findings of police misconduct and that officers who are allowed to resign instead of facing criminal charges should also be forced to give up their police certification. Well, the tri-state mayor says he didn't know his own police chief's discipline record until the nine on your side I-Team gave it to him. The I-Team spent months investigating how local police departments police their own. So tonight, Chief Investigator Craig Cheatham takes a closer look at the village of Elmwood Place. I could still feel everything, all the emotions that I felt that day. The last time Amber Key was here, she thought she was going to die. Am I ever going to be able to see my kids? Is this, is this the end for me? This is Amber Key seven months ago handcuffed on her stomach right after Elmwood Place police officer Robert McConnell tased her because she refused to get out of her parked car. You're supposed to be protecting and serving and you out here abusing people. Before that, McConnell had asked Key and her husband Princeton Hingston to pull over after they stopped near him at a traffic light. Vine and Linden, yeah. Key's husband admitted to McConnell that he had just smoked a joint. They say McConnell searched him, told him to get in his police car, then ordered Key to get out. All I was asking was what was going on. That was the only thing I asked, was what was going on, because I was so confused. McConnell opened her door and said Key pulled it back on his leg, a claim she denies. Then McConnell tased her. I don't understand it. McConnell claimed that since the car engine was running, 
Ms. Key could flee the scene, potentially dragging me, which could have resulted in serious bodily harm or death to me. Due to Ms. Key's aggressive, assaultive actions, I utilized my taser to render Ms. Key compliant. I saw the whole thing. William Wilson, the mayor of Elmwood Place, says he saw a Facebook video clip of Key closing the door on McConnell's leg. I can tell you right now, if you closed your car door in my leg, I'm going to punch you in your mouth. The mayor says the video post was deleted. No, they don't show you that. The I-team couldn't confirm when that video was posted. The woman who recorded this part of the incident told us she did not record or post video like the mayor described. This means now in session. Roll call, please. When the village council hired McConnell a year ago, Elmwood Place was the fifth police department McConnell had worked for in less than five years. In every community where he worked, police records show residents complained he was too aggressive and wrote too many tickets. As a Mechanicsburg officer last year, the police chief disciplined McConnell for repeatedly failing to follow orders and for making a false arrest. McConnell resigned. I did not know that, and I could also say... Um, does that concern you? Well, it, it, it does concern me. We're only provided of what they provide us. So if they leave something out, it's disciplinary. Or if they leave a certification out, we do not know that. Well, you should know that. Well, how would I know that I get everything if I, if I put it? Because you can ask for their personnel file from the places where they worked Correct. before you hire them. Correct. Three years ago, before the mayor took office, the village hired former Lincoln Heights police officer David Smack. What he does not need to do is to have a badge or a gun. Michael Glover says Smack tased him in the back, then stomped on his injured spine during a brutal traffic stop five years ago in Lincoln Heights. Glover's story was the focus of a 2014 I-Team investigation. It's hard to walk. Smack denied stomping on Glover's back. The police department defended his use of the taser. Glover sued Smack and other Lincoln Heights officers for violating his civil rights. He lost, but is appealing. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. As a Lincoln Heights officer, Smack was repeatedly disciplined. Elmwood hired him two months after the I-Team story in 2014. In February of this year, Elmwood Place suspended Smack for 10 days after he deployed his taser without good reason in a UDF, then provided intentionally misleading information about the incident. A few months ago, Elmwood fired Smack because he failed to file a report for a woman who said she was raped. He's gone on to hurt other people. I wanted to make sure through what I was doing that that did not occur. That don't last too long here. The mayor says the village doesn't tolerate bad policing and proved it by hiring full-time officers and promoting Eric Bartlett to police chief. Were you aware of the three written reprimands that he had received? No, I was not. Don't you think you should have known that? Uh, yeah, we should have known that. In 2014, Bartlett, then a corporal, was reprimanded for failing to show up for work not securing credit cards of a defendant, repeatedly failing to properly file timely reports, and Bartlett was the focus of an internal investigation after a tow lot owner felt threatened by him. That wasn't in his police chief's file. The I-team finally received Bartlett's written reprimands, but only after repeatedly asking for additional records. How did these suddenly appear? I have, unless there was another file, like I said, we were in transition. There have been files. Are you concerned? Are you concerned about that? Yeah, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna check into it. Absolutely. This place needs to be shut down. For Amber Key, the policing in Elmwood Place is the reason she still avoids the village, knowing that just this brief visit with us brought back too many painful memories. It's like reliving the moment all over again. Amber Key was charged with resisting arrest and obstruction of justice, but those charges were dismissed. Four months after the tasing incident, the village promoted McConnell to detective. Craig Cheatham, Nine on Your Side. Hamilton police officer Ray Nickting denied it, but his own dash camera recording showed Nickting was still pursuing a suspect. 
a Hamilton Police Department internal investigation determined that Nickting drove erratically and up to 82 miles an hour on city streets while he claimed he wasn't pursuing. Outbound on Route 4. Hamilton Police Lieutenant Michael Waldeck concluded Nickting provided false information to the police department several times and didn't tell the truth until two weeks after the pursuit, after Nickting knew the incident was under investigation. For violating the pursuit policy and being untruthful, the police department gave Nickting a written reprimand. Quite frankly, I don't think the public has a lot of interest in this. When the I-Team interviewed Hamilton Police Chief Craig Buchheit in October, he said we were wrong to focus on the case and that he considered the matter closed. This officer was wrong. Um, he admitted that he was wrong. And he was disciplined appropriately and accordingly. And we moved on. But there was one move Chief Buchheit didn't make. He never told the Butler County Prosecutor's Office that his department determined one of its own officers had been dishonest on the job. It's something that I should know about and I should be able to inquire about it. Prosecutor Mike Moser learned about Nickting's dishonesty and other cases of untruthful police officers in Butler County from the Nine on Your Side I-Team. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't like that. I don't like that. A half century ago, in the case of Brady versus Maryland, the Supreme Court ruled that prosecutors are required to disclose information that may hurt their own cases because it's in the interest of justice. That means Moser and other prosecutors must tell the defense if key witnesses, including police officers, have a record of dishonesty. Do you think you've done enough to find Brady material? No, absolutely not. Why not? Well, simply because I felt that I was doing everything that was necessary at the time, and I didn't have any issues with any of the cases at that time. Moser, who has been the Butler County prosecutor since 2011, admits he hadn't asked police chiefs or the sheriff to refer possible Brady cases involving police misconduct to his office. Why didn't you ask for this information earlier? Well because I have a community of police officers that I know and trust. If that information is not given to the prosecutor and the prosecutor doesn't ask for it, and that information isn't provided to the defense, you are basically hamstringing a person's ability to defend their client. We shared our findings with veteran criminal defense attorney Carl Lewis. Justice isn't blind there, justice is peaking, and it's peaking in a way to say, we're not gonna provide information that will be helpful to the defense, and that hurts you. Now, one of the big questions, is did the officers with records of dishonesty provide critical testimony in cases that could now be at risk? Every case that I have prosecuted, I am confident, had no Brady violation issues involved in them. How do you know that? Well, because I know every case that I've prosecuted. I deal with the police officers in those cases. Have you reviewed those cases since we've had our conversations? Yeah, I've reviewed those cases. But Moser admitted he's only reviewed cases he personally prosecuted. Moser says his office will adopt the Brady guidelines used by Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters. Dieters' policy requires police departments to inform prosecutors of an officer's use of excessive force, untruthfulness, and misconduct as it relates to his or her duties as a law enforcement officer. I appreciate your investigation. I do understand where you have gone with that. It is one of the reasons why I am willing to expand what I am doing with respect to Brady. Moser attached his new policy with a letter to the police chiefs and sheriff in Butler County. It's going to make police officers more accountable and more aware of their responsibility to do the right things. This doesn't tell the whole story. One of Prosecutor Moser's letters was addressed to Hamilton Police Chief Craig Buchheit in October. Buchheit told us he considered the case of Officer Ray Nickting closed. And we've moved on. Moser believes county prosecutors should share their Brady lists with each other. And this is one reason why. Former Colerain Township Sergeant Joe Redman was put on the Hamilton County list, then got hired by the new Miami PD in Butler County, which doesn't have a list. Craig Cheatham, 9 on your side.